It only recently started becoming well known publicly that Snapchat was paying out like crazy. You guys saw that early, which is awesome. Super early. Anywhere it's quiet, that's where the money is. What kind of revenue is that generating? Between Facebook and Snapchat combined, we got up to dollars a month. There are some episodes that would generate $10,000 that were just a cut up of a YouTube video with no extra work. So we're like, wow, this is mm. insane. All right, welcome, bro. How old are you, by the way? I'm 23. All right, I'm cool. old now. And then, um, I mean, you've been doing this probably, what, for a decade? So, Starting businesses, yeah. online hustles. How did, you make, how did you make your first dollar? My first dollar? First dollar in general, and then first dollar as an entrepreneur. First dollar, I worked at an insurance company doing mm -hmm. filing paperwork for, for one summer. I was like an intern. Um, good life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> I quickly leveled up from there. Yeah. Uh, and I went and worked at a grocery store. I worked at Vaughn's, like, near my house. And it was an atrocious job. Like, it was, it was brutal. Like, people... I, I saw people die. The store got robbed multiple times. Oh, like, shit. drug overdoses. And it wasn't even, like, that bad of an area. It sounds, like, mm -hmm. way crazier than it was. But, yeah, it was definitely, like, a... That's a, job. that's a humbling experience because I worked in restaurants too. I understand that. I actually think it's good because yeah. it shows you how rude people can be and how just like disrespectful most humans are. And well, I think that makes you a better person. Person, I'm, I'm going to make my kids work in a restaurant at some point in their life probably because yeah. of that. No, it's humbling. I think it makes you appreciate money a lot more too. But you really see how crazy the community is that you live in when you work at like a restaurant yeah. or a grocery store. I didn't have that outlook on like my area until I saw how crazy these people were. Yeah. And so then how old were you when you were working at the insurance agency at Vons? I, I mean, I, I think I was like 16 or, or 16 and a half, whatever, like uh -huh. you can, First I don't half. know if that's driving or if that's working, but 17 at the insurance company and then 18 at Vons mm. um, at that time. But I was like, I mean, at that time I was definitely not the most motivated individual. Mm. I was right out of high school. And in high school, I was definitely one of those kids who was like getting the, you know, those early delinquent years out, yeah. like smoking every day, like not really driven at oh, all. Yeah. So I don't think a lot of people expected anything past that. And I think that's what like sparked a little fire in me because I was going to community college. You went to university? Yeah. Well, so you hardly. Okay. Did you, you obey Harvard of the West, they call it. Yeah, of course. Did you make fun of like the, the community college kids like no nah, well i didn't like make fun of them no but to me it, you know what i'm saying i mean i never really looked at like community colleges like uh like do you really learn that much i mean i didn't even learn anything at college like do you really learn anything at community college like and a big part of college you know is connections mm -hmm. and growing as a person and i feel like at community college you you miss out on both of those do neither of those definitely do neither of those but to me it was like okay i'm gonna go to community college I'm going to take the same courses and then I'm going to transfer in two yeah. years and just have the cheaper run. But anyways, the reason I said that is like people in high school are definitely like judge you. Like if you're going to community college, you're like the loser. You're like the hometown hero. Mm -hmm. So I, I just had like this little bit of like, I would, I, I want to prove people wrong a little bit, whether mm -hmm. like that was real or if that was just in my head. It like, you were like, no one, no one thought, no one thinks I'm going to be the guy that makes it out of this town. I got to go. Yeah. Go. Yeah. So like it was that. definitely like a little bit like that. Like I was hungry. I, I, I was like the classic. I was a dude doing pushups at 3 a.m. in his room. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like watching Gary V videos. That's, that's my guy. Like I started watching Gary V videos and I would like write down notes. At that time I was like trying to learn the stock market. I thought that was yeah. my way out. You know, we all started with day trading. Yeah. Like. yeah. Yeah. Every that's kid started with day trading, drop shipping, something like that. Anything where you could press a button and like make money. I'm like studying the charts. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. I'm just writing it down my notebook. But yeah, I, I, um, I had a friend in high school who was a part of a YouTube group called, called free time. It was like a group channel. One of the main guys reaction time. He had most of the subs. Mm -hmm. And he was one of my best friends in, in high school. Shout out, Nick. And he brought me to one of their parties. I think it was like a Halloween or New Year's party. And I was not like a big party person. But I was like, you know, this is a time for me to like network. Like, mm -hmm. let me go and like try and like work my way in here. Show up to this big house in Encino. There's this huge line out front. There's armed security guards. This is like so new to me. I'm like, this is insane. Pre-COVID? Pre-COVID. Okay. Pre no. Peak COVID. Oh, really? Yeah, no. Oh, interesting. Not no, pre-COVID. But he, like, comes out. He brings me through the front of the line. I'm, I'm like, people are looking at me. We're like, why is this? Can I cuss on you? Yeah. AdSense. You can say whatever you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, get in there or whatever, and it's, like, insane to me. Big house, people everywhere. And I'm like, okay, 
Like, who lives at this house? Mm-hmm. Like, because the, the, whoever lives here has this figured out. And Nick, my boy, like, gave me the rundown of, like, all these creators. And he was like, and then Jason, the manager. And I was like, okay, the manager's the guy, right? The, ma- the manager's the guy who's going to give me the job. So I was like, you know, take a few shots at the party, got a little bit loose. And then I, he told me who Jason was. And I just cold approached him. I was like, hey, let me be your assistant. Like, I'll, or I'll do anything. Like, yeah. I'll do anything you want. And he was like, all right, bro. Like, <laughs> what are you saying right now? So it was, like, really awkward. But I ended up, like, coming back up to him again. It, like, turned into this meme where I would, like, ask to be his assistant. I ended up coming to, like, some filming shoots at the house, like, later. And it was, like, this constant meme until one day he, he pretty much said that I could work for free for him and this is a day a terrible day after Vaughn's like this this man had I again I don't want to like cuss on here but he you can say whatever himself you want. in the aisle and I had to clean it up and the same day like a You're Disney movie in the aisle. yeah That's it was disgusting the same day like a Disney movie called me it's like you can work for free for 30 days and if you're good I'll start paying you I was like crying tearing up on the phone trying to be cool like you know like yeah sounds good and he's like you got to quit your job tomorrow quit they're like you're never getting a union job again you can't just quit and I was like oh my gosh like like, did I make this mistake yeah like I was never gonna be able to get like a job like this again but yeah after that I just like grinded for the next 30 days I put up LEDs under his bed and like hung up uh pictures on the wall and was doing like very basic basic shit here's my takeaway from that because I'm so glad you said that you know, I was just in San Diego hanging out with Blake, mm-hmm. and I brought Blake around all of my college buddies. Mm-hmm. Um, nobody asked him anything. It was crazy to me. I was like, because I'm like pretty successful compared to like a lot of my friends. Blake is actually really successful, yeah. and nobody asked him anything. Right? You're, it's a huge this, opportunity. Yeah, and yeah, and I, I, it blows my mind. Like, if if I'm ever in the same room with someone massive. Bro, throw your ego out the window, like, and, and go talk. Like, don't be fucking weird, but, like, go talk to them. Fake it till you make it if you have to, right? And yeah. you fully made the most of that opportunity, and that was completely life-changing. So that's badass, first of all. Yeah. 99% of people can't do that, oh, and that's yeah. what it takes. And yeah. I, I feel like that's a, a big commonality between most of the young guys our age because you don't just, like, figure it out by yourself. Mm-hmm. So you, you, you get lucky, you run into that. People talk about luck. Oh, he got lucky. That was your luck, and you made the most of it. No, 100%. 99% of people won't do that. Yeah, and it's so awkward, and it's so weird. Like, it was weird. Like, going up to somebody, like, it took shots in me before I was like, all right, I'm going to go up and ask this guy. But, yeah, those little things changed, like, the trajectory of your life. Like, those moments where you act on, like, a random moment, especially early on, like, that that changed the game for me. Like, I I cried to work for free. You know what I'm saying? Like, that was such a big deal to me. Um, Did you think in your head, like, this is it. Like, this is what's going to change everything. Or I, you, like, I, I didn't know if it else. was going to be like my big, like break where I was going to start making a bunch of money, but I knew it was like key and like getting out of like a regular job. And I was just excited to do anything YouTube related, you know, cause obviously I was like a consumer of YouTube my whole life. And I tried to make videos for a little bit and I was like, okay, I want to be a part of this. Um, but I mean, first days I was, I wasn't doing any of that. I was like, again, hanging shit up on the wall. I was, like, getting food for the guys. And at this time, like, they were, they were gearing up to start a management company. Where are you living, by the way? I was living at home. Oh, okay. I was still going to college at this time, too. Oh, okay, Community gotcha. college. Yeah, yeah. So I'd, like, work, and then I'd go there after. Sometimes I'd, like, get there before they even wake up, and I'd be, like, knocking on his door, like, locked outside. Like, the kid was <laughs> really, really trying so hard. Yeah. Uh, but they were, they were gearing up to launch this management company, and there was all these, like, people around the house, like doing dances and stuff and they're like this new platform was coming out called tiktok or wasn't coming out it was out and they were like the first management company and there was like these random people that were like you know tiktokers at the time it was like random it's like what is this new like platform it's like musically it was kind of weird and it just switched into tiktok yeah just yeah. switched into tiktok it wasn't weird for you to have the app downloaded or whatever for the first time ever oh yeah i didn't download the app for a bit even into mm. that so yeah it was it was definitely weird at that time it was like a lot of dancing stuff yeah but by the end of the 30 days it was perfectly lined up with the launch of the company so they were like you can come on as a coordinator we'll pay you 3k a month i don't know if that's a leak that's a leak whatever i was so like at that point that's that's when i thought i had made it actually mm. at that point i dropped out 
at $3,000 a month, $36,000 a year. I dropped out of college. I was like, yo, <laughs> this is it. Mom called her. Another one of these, like, um, I guess I'm going to cry. I'm like tearing up. I'm like, mom, $3,000 a month. I'm, I'm thinking about like how I'm going to be able to like go out with my boys and get some food, you know, like, yeah. like the very basic things. That what did your parents think of that? They were just like happy for me because nice. they knew how bad I wanted it. Obviously, like they're like, you know, they understand 3K a month isn't really going to get me anywhere like solo but they're super super happy about mm. like me getting that quitting or dropping out of college was another thing that took a little bit more convincing but yeah. the sell is always a pause for anybody trying to drop out of college and and get their parents to you know let it go just be like it's a pause this opportunity is temporary college i can always go back it's a method mm. like that Never went back like that it, yeah patent approved method um and at that point like they were telling me we need you to make decks. We need you to send out emails, you know, do things on Google Calendar. They'd be like, yeah, I got that. Easy. I would go to the bathroom, YouTube tutorial, how to, like, make a spreadsheet, <laughs> how to make a Let's deck. Go. And I'd come out and butcher it completely. Like, there was no hiding that I didn't know what I was yeah. doing. Like, I didn't even know how to structure an email. And a little bit into <laughs> it, they were like, all right, this guy this guy's got to go. <laughs> like, this guy has no idea what he's doing. So it was pretty bad, but Jason the the guy who brought me on in the first place like they they were trying to like let me go but jason was like no i see this kid's hungry like i'll take him under my wing he can be like my assistant or Mm. or whatever um and that's when things really started to progress he was doing a lot of like high level stuff with uh with the company that i got to kind of inherit his roster of talent and i would start Mm. answering their emails i'd start closing deals for them and over the next six months like i just fully downloaded his brain and everything he was doing as a manager and I started signing my own talent, being able to get on the phone and do it. Um, so that's how it kind of accelerated uh, past, like, you know, doing the basic stuff. I started to get my chops a little bit, started closing brand deals. Nice. Back when brands weren't really spending a lot on TikTok and they didn't know how. So there was like a lot of big brands that were excited to spend. Yeah. So it was a little bit easier than it is probably now to just like middleman deals and like yeah. people stuff. But that's the greatest thing about being the first to any industry. It's like, it's crazy. No. First guys to AI, the money's flowing everywhere out of VC's pockets. Yeah. Like, so things are starting to look up for you, right? When, um, when do you start? Cause the, was Snapchat your first business, the Snapchat? And was that an agency or? It was an agency. Snapchat came, Talonex, what was uh, the first official business? It, the first official, my first official business was technically what came right before Snapchat was Jason had sold the company Talent X. I went independent. I was doing brand deals for a little bit. He, mm. We were seeing that creators were making money off subscriptions, not like, you know, like X-rated creators, but like there was creators like Logan Paul had this fan subscription app where it was white labeled and they would do these big launches with exclusive content. Mm. And that seemed like it could be something. So we were like, why don't creators have these discord communities that they can monetize? It's kind of like what school is today where it's like paid communities. Yeah, yeah. We decided we wanted to like go and try and raise money and build uh, like a platform where it was like discord, but with monetization features. That's it's crazy. Like- Cause I think timing is so important. I think you guys were maybe a little bit too yeah. early. You're just a little bit too early. Which is crazy because most people are usually too late, but you guys had it down. Timing and the fact that we had no idea how to code and none of us were like software engineers at all. Yeah. Um, So like a lot of it was trying to like outsource the build, which is like a terrible idea for starting some sort of software company. Better to get a CTR or whatever. Yeah. Just partner with somebody that knows what they're doing. But we ended up going and trying to, to raise money for that. Uh, that was like a nine month process of like a hundred no's probably because it's yeah. pre-product. It's super hard. We're not software guys. And that was like, I mean, getting punched in the face, like a hundred calls over and over. What, what is that? What are those initial couple meetings? Like, you know, I told you I'm about to go raise for the first time yeah. pretty much. Or actually I did raise before for a AI tech startup I had in college, Yeah, but it was like one meeting. The VCs are like, yeah, we're down. We'll give you the money. And then we thought like, okay, we, we did it. We won. Yeah. And the money just never came and we just waited forever. And then the business idea died. I found out, you know, lots of stuff happened between then and there. Yeah. But I had, I've been on like essentially like uh, two meetings total. But what were those early days like? No experience. I mean, it's, it's, raising is intimidating. Yeah, no, it was terrible. I was like 18 or 19 at the time. So like, especially those early calls, like I would be so nauseous to even get on the phone. I was like, okay. Like we're going and asking for like a significant m- millions of dollars to to start the startup. I have no past experience in doing anything like this. 
And all these investors are like... Did your partner have any experience? Yeah, he had experience in like raising money. Mm. So he was definitely the one carrying the call. So I was like robbing, you know, like pitching in, doing like a product demo. We had like a wireframe of what the platform would look like. And I'd do my, mm. do my spiel. The worst part is investors are terrible at saying no. They like let you linger around a little bit. Mm. Some will tell you no like right away. But some that are even loosely interested give you like the sign of like it could be this could work and then maybe we'll do like a second call third call and then you'll like get led on pretty deeply mm-hmm. and you know i was like obviously pretty immature at the time thinking that was it all how do you time. how do you avoid that that's interesting because i haven't heard that before and yeah. it, it makes total sense to me from both standpoints like maybe you want to hear them out see if something see if somebody else gets in you don't want to close the door on these two kids yeah but then how do you how do you go about avoiding that do you just go into it with like Hey, what's up? You know, this is what we're doing. We don't really need the money. Um, if you guys, you know, are interested in getting involved, let us know. But, you know, we're probably closing the round in a month or so. That's, so like, that's exactly that's exactly the method, which we were not doing. Okay. You, like investors, like if you're too, I don't want to say treat them, but if you treat them like too, like you're, like, I don't know. I Thank don't you guys so is. much for your time. Yeah. And shit like that. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's definitely not the move. They want to feel like they're missing out on something that somebody else is going to get the deal. Yeah. It's because as soon as one investor invests, like everybody comes, like the sardines come swarming right after that. So you kind of yeah. have to treat it like you don't need them. And then that's when they're more, more interested in just like probably basic human psychology. But that was kind of like the, the key learning through it all. But then like there was like some economic stuff. COVID started to, to crash down and like, that kind of turned things mm. they kind of like put the the nail in the in the coffin for for that idea but the great part which is the the first real business that worked out is we had a jason had a partner portal with snapchat uh at the time which had the ability for you to get shows we had a client before that had made money through a company called jelly smack mm. uh, they were like the early partners on snapchat and facebook And we saw creators were making pretty significant money. And we didn't know if it was, like, still working. So we had the Snapchat part. What year was that, by the way? What year is this? I'm so bad. I don't even know the year I graduated. I'm trying to remember. That was, like... Like, two years ago, three years ago? I guess the start of it was, like, three years ago. Wow. Like, two and a half years ago. Because I feel like it only... At least in my side of the woods, like, it only recently started becoming well-known publicly that Snapchat was paying out like crazy. Yeah. So you guys saw that early, which is awesome. Super early. Anywhere it's quiet, that's where the money is. Like anytime it's loud, that's that's when things start to get a little bit saturated. Late, but yeah. at that at that moment, it was still pretty quiet. Uh, and you had to be you had to go through a partner of Snapchat to get onboarded. Mm. So it wasn't like the situation where anybody could get on Snapchat and start posting. So we pretty much had this great relationship with Snapchat to onboard shows. We didn't understand how big of an opportunity that was until we onboarded our first client. I was like, hey. There, there was this girl who had a YouTube channel where she did story times. And I was like, hey, like, you know, there's this other platform, Snapchat creators making a lot of money. We can just redistribute. Uh, and did you just cold call her pretty much? Cold email. Mm. Acting like, you know, of course, we had this business figured out. Yeah. As we do. <laughs> uh, and, you know, she agreed. It's a pretty much like a, a no risk offer because it's, it's revenue yeah, yeah. split. So to her, it's like worst case. We, I just have a Snapchat show. Um, but the girl wasn't making probably anything super super significant on youtube made 40k in her first month on snapchat and it was like wow at that moment that was like this huge unlock for us where we realized that like just from ad revenue or what just from ad revenue 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 yeah from three to five minute episodes wow like there are some episodes that would generate ten thousand dollars that were just a cut up of a youtube video with no extra work so we're like wow this is Mm. insane so at that point on i probably didn't see daylight for (laughs) Probably the next six months, I just yeah. sat at my desk just calling every single creator I could because we had this amazing opportunity to help pretty much any creator make a ton of money. Mm-hmm. So that was like kind of our brand, like helping creators redistribute content to Facebook and Snapchat. Uh, it was pretty much like the offer was either we'll get you on, we'll get your show and you can run it or we'll get you a show and we'll do the work for you. So a lot of people didn't have time to like post on Snapchat and trying to figure out the platform. So they're like, okay, if you can get me a show and you can run it and it'll make money and just send me checks every month. It was like a Hormozy Grand Slam offer, whatever you yeah, want to yeah. call it. Nobody and was what's, saying what, no. what's the split look like though? If you're like, I'm going to put you on here and do the work for you, what, what do you take? So we would do 60 40s and we let the creators own the show. Uh, and that offer just scaled like wildfire. Hmm. Like th- we went from one to 10 to 20 to 50 in six months. We had 200, over 250 shows on Snapchat. 
What kind of revenue is that generating? Are you allowed to talk about that? Yeah. Uh, between Facebook and Snapchat combined, we got up to a million dollars a month. Holy shit. Uh, and it was, it was definitely crazy. We had like, at this time, keep in mind, like, hadn't had like my own personal big business before. Jason, this is not like his first rodeo, but I was hi hiring a lot of my high school friends to run shows. That's what I was going to ask is like, what are the logistics behind this? Like, how are yeah. you managing all that? Because managing sucks. Yeah, it was brutal, but fairly simple because it was just redistribution of already existing content. Mm -hmm. So it was basically chopping it up, pacing it for Snapchat, making thumbnails. Every, sh uh, every episode on Snapchat takes four thumbnails. So we'd help creators do all that work. So I'd bring my friends in from high school, minimum wage jobs, working at the teach gym. teach them how to do it from nothing? Teach them how to do it. It is, you know, it's fairly simple. Uh, and we incentivize them on the success of shows. And they'd go from making, you know, minimum wage to at our peak making 25 or 50K a month, like each. Yeah. Holy yeah, shit. like brain surgeons. So it was like a, it was a crazy, crazy moment in time where creators were making a ridiculous amount of money on Snapchat. Um, and what's and, that like working with your friends and hiring your friends? Because, like, I mean, I have friends that have yet, and I'm just like, no, it's not yeah. happen, sorry. Yeah. No, it gets tricky, but honestly, like... What if they just fuck off one day and they, there's a lot of responsibility on them and... Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the, the hard part is there, there's like a, a bit of like a trust barrier, but the people that we had brought in earlier, I just made sure that they were like seen over by somebody who made sure that they were doing a good job. So, you know, if they dropped the ball, worst case, it wasn't client facing where, you know, we dropped the ball for a creator. But I don't know if I just got lucky. I know people have bad experiences mm -hmm. working with their friends, but for the most part, everybody was solid, hardworking. It was kind of like this money machine where if you sat there every single day and put in a dollar, it'd spit out five. And so like, yeah, sorry. No, no, we, we were just like, they were pretty much there all day just posting more and more for every single creator. Um, but yeah, no, it was ridiculous. How many total people did you have in the operation at its height, you think, employees-wise? Employees-wise, like, you'd be surprised because there was a lot of people that wanted to run their own shows. It wasn't anything too crazy. I'd say maybe 10 10 people. Yeah, but still, though, you know, in the period of a year, you're going from zero to multiple millions. You're running this full bit. Most businesses take a long time and they scale really slowly. What was like your mental state? Like, was it exciting? Was it stressful? Was it both? Was it like, what the fuck's going on? Or was it like, well, I'm locked in. We're ramping this thing to the moon. I think the easy answer is like all of the above. Okay. It was my first time making like personally a significant amount of money so it was like wow this is like what it feels like and nothing will ever beat the first time when you have like a, a big check like mm. i'm sure you understand like the first time that I came and nothing will ever m match that i think it's because like going for what was that amount for you it's different for everyone i think it was like a twenty thousand yeah. dollar a month check and it was like you know it was ridiculous i went i went to my parents house and keep in mind like this is a kid who was crying for like 3k yeah job 20k were like celebrating and it was like this is insane like how is this even possible they're a little skeptical they're like this doesn't really make you sense selling drugs or what no no for sure like that's what most parents think of these kids it was the same thing with the 19 year old in san diego oh yeah they shut him down yeah yeah they were like uh so for background for everyone listening that we met this guy in san diego he's like 19 he's making multiple millions and he made his first like 100k or something like that at 12 and his parents were like they shut him down they like took away his computer access and he's like I'm fucking cooking here. <laughs> and they're like, no, you're doing something illegal. They yeah. just don't understand it. Oh, that's ridiculous. I get it, though. Yeah, they're supportive, but they, I mean, they still, to this day, I don't think they understand. Like, yeah. I, it's a constant pursuit to try and explain to them what I'm doing at the moment. But every single month, that 20 turned into 40, turned into 60, 80, and 100, so on. And it was just like every single month was this, like, new celebration of, like, how is this getting crazier and crazier? But and that, are you celebrating or are you really I mean, are you celebrating? I'm going to my parents' house on like Sunday night, like just going like I mean, celebrating, like just going and spending. No, I mean, in like general, that. though, like, you know, being what are you 19 at that point, yeah, making 20. tons of money, like compared to others your age. Are you were you splurging at all? Or you were like, no, I'm not bored. at all. Really? I, every I don't know if this is like a weird psychotic way to look at it, but every hour that I spent doing something different, I was doing like a mathematical calculation of how much I was losing. I get that. Anything else. Like if the opportunity is not going to be here forever, I got to make no. most of it. So I, I sat in front of my desk for months straight. Wow. Like I, I did not do anything else besides that. Um, so yeah, when I say celebrating, it was just like going to my, my parents' house or whatever, but I was, 
I wasn't splurging. The, the first step was like unlocking this, this revenue for myself. And obviously there was 200 creators. And for most of them, this was like their main revenue stream. So for Jason and I to be the people that were giving these people like new, I mean, it was changing lives. Like my friends were paying mm. off their loans. Creators, I'm sure, were making a crazy amount of money spending in whatever. Like it was such an amazing position to be in, to do that for, for 200 people. Um, but my friends personally, when they started to make money, that was like the next thing I started like, what other person in my network can I bring in mm. that I can help make money? And I just like, it turned into this. That must like, be like a God like feeling. Like I'm the guy in my Untouched. friend group who no one expected to make it out. And I'm the one that's plugging everyone with awesome jobs. Right. It now. was like insane. It, it was really like, it was one of the best feelings ever. That one might be sweeter. Not like the power of it all, but seeing your friends win mm-hmm. and them go through that same like phase you were when you were first shocked to get your first check and watching that process repeat over and over. It's like, it's pretty, pretty unmatched. I'm glad you said that, dude. And that was a question I was going to ask a little later, but let's get into it now. I feel like, um, I don't know. You meet a lot. Of, there's a lot of different types of characters in the young entrepreneur space. This is like people that are under, you know, 25, 26 that make a lot of money. Yeah. I've run into a lot of uh, people that are like pieces of shit, a lot of people that are really fucking weird, but I've also met a lot of people who are like fucking awesome, Mm. right? Um, We were just talking about a few of them who I was hanging with in San Diego. Blake Anderson, if you're watching this, the GOAT, right? No, he is. And you know, that's the conversation we had over the weekend is like, bro, there's no shortage of awesome people out there, good people, hardworking people, unique individuals. There's no point like sacrificing your energy for some of the bad ones but i'm curious if you've ever had any like what are most of the people that you see that have you know your kind of money at your age like um i think that's a tough question i i rarely see people that are the people that are truly actually i would say like dickheads and mean actually the majority of the time like from my experience, have less money mm. and are at like this certain stage where they feel like they're like above people slightly. Yeah. That's like the, that's the part where it's like a little bit sour mm. where they haven't had like maybe a super, super insane jump. But most, for the most part, people with like similar amounts of money or, or more have been, have been super chill. I think especially ones who had a job before yeah. their big break, I think that like it keeps you pretty grounded with like what it means to do that. So mm. I haven't had too many bad experiences. Of course, there's like bad people, but yeah. thankfully I haven't had to like work with them or That's anything good. like that. What about, um, what about ageism? Oh yeah. Like the, I mean, I, I'm, you must've experienced a lot of that, right? Like, especially in the Snapchat, um, the whole Snapchat series, like were there, what was that like? No, were there people that were like, there's, they just didn't take you seriously or, or did Snapchat, what was, what was Snapchat itself, the upper, the upper guys yeah. at Snapchat, talking to you guys about? Yeah. Well, there was some other young people making money on Snapchat. I mean, a lot of young people were making money on Snapchat, so we weren't like necessarily the mm. anomalies. But Jason, at that time, I think he's like 25 years old, so at least he was like, you know, somewhat of adult. So some people, I'm sure that's like still like a kid. Yeah. So you like at the size that we were scaling at. But for Snapchat specifically, it wasn't, it wasn't too diff- difficult. I think they... They always, I mean, we were bringing in significant volume. Mm-hmm. So, like, they treated us like professionals, because, which is I'm grateful for. How did this stop? Like, what, what was the end it of this whole trend? It didn't stop, like, dead stop. Snapchat wanted to shift their priorities from, from doing a ton of shows to Snap Stories, which are a little bit more creator direct. So their priorities shifted, and it slowed down. But it wasn't, like, a complete stop. But it was to a point where it's like, okay... Let's build something bigger than just a Snapchat agency, Mm. which is great. And we continued to do it. But that's when like things started to expand. And like I started to look at other things. Jason um, had told me that uh, Fortnite had opened up their ecosystem where you can like build maps and make money, which sounds like a complete 180 side quest, which arguably it is. Um, and I was like, okay, that's, that's interesting. Like new platform, pretty much anytime after Snapchat, anytime a platform has a new initiative, I'm acting on it. Cause that yeah. was like what worked last time for sure. The, the management company that sold ahead of that time was, ta- was TikTok when it first started. So it was like a new platform coming out. There's always new opportunities. So when Fortnite changed to like this ecosystem where you can post on it, like I was, I was calling people, I actually saw a TikTok 
from Clicks. He's this yeah. uh, Fortnite creator. Um, he was going over the payouts for for the month for like one of the first months, and it showed like the top person making five million dollars in a, in a for month. making oh. maps for making maps on Fortnite. How do you make the money off making maps? Like what? So is how, it a lot of people play your map or something or what? Yeah, people play your map, but. It wasn't necessarily about like people buying things in your map. That's not how it works on Fortnite. It's like if people were buying skins, all that money goes into the ecosystem. They 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 took forty percent of all of the skin sales and distributed that Holy to shit. all of the map creators. That's a lot. No, Fortnite's one of the biggest games in the world, so it was ridiculous yeah. amount of money. But I'm just saying forty percent. That's like it almost seems like an absurd number to just like that's a technically that's a distribution, right? Yeah, but that's an absurd. Ecosystem. No, it was ridiculous. And so, wait, how do you make maps? Is that coding or is that design specific? Yeah. I mean, yeah. So, like, at this point, previous experience with trying to raise money for the, the software yeah. thing, I knew I, like, needed to have some partners that were, like, understood how to build games. So I, <laughs> I DM'd, actually, this Fortnite creator who had a Snapchat show that was doing really well, and we were, like, always going neck and neck on Snapchat, like, competing for the top shows on the platform. And I knew he was, like, super entrepreneurial. And I DM'd him, and I was like, how are your Fortnite maps doing? And he's like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. And I sent him the click screenshot of all the payouts, and I was like, yeah, man, I got all these devs. Like, I'm, I'm going to start doing maps. And he's like, no way. I can market these maps for sure. And I'm like, great, like let's 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 partner on these maps. Damn. Did not have any devs at the oh. <laughs> Didn't have any not any devs. But Jason yeah. had connections to people who had made Fortnite maps, so I wasn't like yeah. completely stretching it. But I was just trying to like work a deal, see what could spark up. Well that's great because now I mean, like, you know, once you got him on board, then you can go to devs and say, We already got the, the marketing down, like we just need your help. That's a method. It's a no brainer. Use one side to get the other side. For sure. So at this point there was a bunch of kids who had built maps for fun that as soon as Fortnite turned the spigot on, we're making millions of dollars in a single month. That's insane. And then, and then, and what, today they're still like, they're still printing? Because I assume, yeah. I assume like they're kind of grandfathered in, right? Yeah, they're still like the top maps on the platform. They're legacy guys, tens of millions of dollars every single year. And why were they just willing to share their sauce with you? Just because they, they were like young kids or what? Just kids. Were most of these guys young? Most of them were young. I mean, I guess, I mean, yes, they were young. So there was, there was kids that are like 20. Mm. Uh, and then like the old, I'd say the older people were like 25 max. But most of them were like teens to, to 20. And I mean, any kid making millions of dollars off their Fortnite map that wasn't making a ton of money or any money at all, instantly succeeding. Everybody's hitting them up. They're, I think they were just excited to talk about it. But mm. we were able to get a lot of good information on where these developers were and how to build maps from from scratch. So we had access to these Discord servers where there was like hundreds of developers and we'd go through and we'd spam every single person asking like, hey, will you build a map for us? And a lot of people were like, you know, fuck you, I'm not going to build a map for you. I can, I'm just going to build a map for myself. So it was yeah. hard to find developers. But what was, your, what was your value prop? Why, why should someone build one for you as opposed we to... We were trying else? to leverage like Luke's name because he was a Fortnite mm. YouTuber and it was like, you're going to build maps for creators and you know we'll pay you. Um, and, and then we came across these guys uh, or one guy specifically who was like, um, yeah, I'll build a map for you for like 300 bucks or whatever. <laughs> and I was like, bet. So we, we were like going through... And that has to be a good map though, right? I haven't played Fortnite well, in so long. So, so we would go through and we would play maps. What does that mean, by the way, maps? Like, are you like, changing up the entire thing? So there's like Battle Royale, yeah. which is like the main game that people come and play for. Yeah. And then there's different like side, like mini game modes mm. that you can make. Mm, so okay. maps are just like your, your game, basically. Gotcha, okay. So, yeah, so we would go and like play some of these games and the thumbnails were like atrocious. Game developers had no idea how to make thumbnails. And our favorite games, like one of them was like, uh, it was this Mr. Beast format. It was like survive 100 days in the circle mm. and you would like kill zombies and stay in the circle. And there was another one that was just like a gun game with low gravity, very basic stuff. And I would be like addicted to it. I'm like, let's just pay people to make games that are already working and we'll just package them better. Because like, these are like new games are successful. They're making a lot of money right now. Let's just go to all the successful games, clone them and just 
put a better thumbnail. That's huge because that's that's just as important. It's more important. No, and I've yeah. noticed that on my own podcast too. I'll drop like an amazing podcast back when I didn't know how to do thumbnail. I still yeah. don't know how to do thumbnails, but I have people for me you now. You know. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Phil's really good at them as well. But uh, like he switched my thumbnail the other day on a pod that was like fucking crashing and it immediately changed it. So it's, it's more important. No, so you're, you're combining two different industries and immediately it's just ripping, right? First map, spent $300 on it. It was the Survive 100 Days. We literally took like a Mr. Beast style, his thumbnail where he's like in the helicopter and there's the island in the background. Yeah. Not that you're like an average Mr. Beast fan or whatever, but it was like a, a really big video for Mr. Beast and we took it and we like Fortniteified it with a Fortnite character. Mm. So it was a recognizable thumbnail that people had seen from the past. Wait, they watched Mr. Genius. Beast video and it was like a perfect thumbnail, perfectly optimized because it's Mr. Beast. He knows what he's doing with thumbnails and it was Survive 100 Days and it was, it was like a top 15 map instantly. Holy shit. Instantly popped off and we're like, this is crazy. And then we had the, the gun game. How did you make off like a top 15 map like that? In the first month off the two first maps that we dropped, yeah. we turned like $300 into a quarter mil. Oh my God. <laughs> that's insane. It's ridiculous. It was, Dude, there's such a, that's such a good lesson though. Like it literally makes no sense to try and figure out a new method when you could kind of steal somebody else's and just tweak it slightly. It's zoink and twist is what me and, and Luke call it. We take what somebody's doing, and this is like everybody has this method, obviously, yeah. but it works so well here. Take what's already working and like add your own unique twist or whatever value add that's unique to you. Put it on something that's working and half of your idea is already a, that's, like, approved with the market. That's exactly what we're starting to learn right now with my own business. Like I obviously have an activewear brand and... Um, for the longest time, we were trying to create our own products, custom cut, and so everything, new next generation product, failure, failure, failure. Like we went like eight months without a single product, right? Yeah. Horrible. And that's like everything in the clothing yeah. industry because not only is your revenue just dying over time when you don't release something new, but you're not bringing in new traffic. So when you release wow. a new product, you not only bring new revenue for all the old customers that buy stuff, but you bring back new ones that are now like, I wanna go buy some of the old stuff too. And then I hopped on a call with Grant Wins, who's a friend of mine now. He's founder of, uh, you know, Build Basics. It's I like a big active work company. They probably do like 50 million a year. Wow. And maybe more, honestly, at this point, probably. But he's like, bro, what are you doing? And I was like, what? He's like, why are you trying to like reinvent the wheel when you don't have yeah. the time, the resources, or the expertise? And I was like, uh, like just sitting there like... Fuck, he's That's right. A good point. And he goes, what I want you to do is I want you to go into your favorite uh, top quality activewear store, like your probably biggest competitor, and grab their best product, send that right to your manufacturer, and have them redo it. And say, change it slightly. Put your logo on it. Change the sleeves up a little bit. Make it a little shorter. Whatever you got to do to make it more custom to your brand. And he said, that is what you do until you hit at least $100 million. And... And that was, that was probably game. I mean, we're, we've yet to see, but all of the new products we have coming out soon are like almost exactly based off of the top best-selling products for some other massive brands. But we, I think we made them slightly better. We catered them slightly more to our audience. They're slightly more athletic looking. So like, you know, some of these, I'll just say Lululemon. We just stole Lululemon's yeah, product yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we made it better, honestly, in my opinion. Um, more, more like... Just more catered toward like towards like a young athletic male versus yeah. like the average everyday person, and um, and it's fucking sick, and yeah. it's gonna come out in like a month or two, and we're gonna see how that does. Um, but that was probably a game changer for us. We've yet to see the method never fails. Like I I use that in pretty much everything because you you guarantee half of your idea is already approved by like a mass market of people yeah and then you add your own like unique twist and it's, it, it works in everything so. and whether it's mr beast or lululemon like the kings of their game they're putting tens of millions of dollars into research and development and 100 percent. yeah so, why compete with them when you just no <laughs> no it, yes tastefully yeah tastefully whatever yeah. you want to call it inspiration make it a little better yeah but that that next map we were, I mean, it was so lucky. What is that feeling like, by the way? Well, I, I was saying like nothing beats the first feeling of making a lot of money. Yeah. But the second time is super validating because it's like, okay, the first time wasn't just a one hit wonder. Mm -hmm. Like I was able to see an opportunity and act for a second time. So that was like, I think built a lot of confidence where it's like, okay, like anytime there's a new platform, like that's a greater lesson here. If yeah. there's a new platform, 
act on it. I think a lot of people see like there's a new platform and they and they don't know if it makes money, so they don't really act on it. And then they wait for people to like do it. And then all of a sudden everybody's making money and it's like, oh, and then they go and try it. That's some sauce right there. Be the first one to try everything. Yeah. No, and well, here's here's the real sauce. The first people that try it obviously like win and make a lot of money. After a little bit, it gets a little bit more competitive. All the people that, you know, they're, they're bragging about making so much money, more more competition comes into play. It gets a little bit harder. It evolves. And then people start to go through this, like, this phase where it's, like, informed. The uninformed optimism goes away, and it gets a little bit more difficult. People start failing. And then a ton of people quit because they posted a ton of maps. They've invested into it. Mm. It didn't hit for them right away. And the second wave is where the money's made. Like, this wow. is the real sauce. Because now everybody who tried and quit the first time is out of the out of the picture. And the people that actually stuck with it are quietly printing for a long time. Mm. It's like in hide-and-seek. Like, when you check one place one time, you never go back and check the same mm. place twice. Yeah. So the people that are part of the second wave are the ones that usually make the most money. Because they stuck through the struggle. Yeah. They got out of the valley of despair, the Hormozy line. And that, that's, that's where the real printers come out. That's how it was on Snapchat, too. Like, yeah. we were not the first to Snapchat. Jelly Smack was the first to Snapchat. They became a billion-dollar company off Snapchat and Facebook. What is Jelly Smack? I still don't know. Content distribution company. Oh, they, they were doing the same thing we did on Facebook. That's Snapchat, crazy. They were just playing off somebody else's uh, ecosystem, essentially. Yeah. And what... Um, I'm curious, did you ever have any moments that were, like, near-death experiences in either of those companies where it literally was like, I, we're fucked, and then you guys pushed through it, and it... it succeeded or at that point it was just it was pretty oh it's going up i would say like since snapchat and facebook were like cash flowing there was never a moment where like these were like highly profitable businesses we're never not going to make like overhead yeah but things change a lot like the platform the problem with building on platforms is when they decide to change they decide to change and your business changes overnight yeah. so that's that's the i guess downside of it but you kind of have to adapt so it's this constant like reset hmm. where it's even playing field and now new players can come in and win so like i mean i'm sure there's other versions of me and jason and hmm. luke and our other founders that will jump on a new platform like microsoft start is like the new version what is that exactly new platform opens up for creators to make money on Micro microsoft start microsoft start what is it is it a game is it a so it's like microsoft's platform for distributing content to their whole ecosystem hmm. it's fairly new even we're still learning about it right now, so I'm sure it's some sauce for anybody who like wants to act Check on that out. platform. Yeah, it's another situation where you need to have uh, a portal or a partnership with Microsoft. So mm. we're lucky enough to get it. We've like built businesses off platforms for a while now, so it's easier, and we have a lot of great people at the company to uh, to get that for us. So we're starting to explore that now. Mm. So that's kind of like a, the the new version of what maybe that that Snapchat story was where we can onboard people onto Microsoft start, distribute their content to the ecosystem, make money. And nobody's saying no to making more money off their content, mm. you know? So another opportunity to put a bunch of creators on is kind of how we're looking at it. Write that down, write that down. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm actually just very curious. So I'm gonna go check it out. Yeah. But how long, so how long did the Fortnite uh, era run for? Are you still, still running? Today? Still running. Damn. Yeah. They turned into a whole Fortnite game studio. Uh, we ended up, uh, having a ton of more maps succeed after that we got like 50 million plays on snapchat or not on snapchat on fortnite and we decided to do a branded project so there's a bunch of brands that spend they wanted to get into the ecosystem it's kind of like a new experimental way to do like a you know experience based advertising yeah so it was tax season coming up and TurboTax. we ended up winning a pitching to them to do like a, a fortnite map for taxes which you know like tax wait that seems kind of how many kids that play Fortnite oh, so, even do so? Tax? So, so here's, well, the, the average Fortnite player is between 18 and, and 24. Really? Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm sure there's a ton of kids that play. But that's they like... They probably grew up with it, to be honest. There's, I'm thinking about Because when, when did you first start playing? 14? Yeah. yeah I was 14. So exactly. Now we're 14. 23, 24. Yeah, exactly. So, like... And Fortnite is, like, hundreds of millions of players. Yeah. So... They want to get into a, like a you know a new, younger audience. Hmm. Uh, so it was like an experimental thing for them. And... You know, like we were pretty successful with with creating games, but bringing TurboTax into Fortnite and making that a fun game, like there's probably not more boring things than taxes to make fun in Fortnite. So it was definitely a challenge, but 
the way we flipped it is we created, there was these tycoon game modes where you basically like level up your life in game and they're like very addicting. You like make money in them. So we, we made like some Sam shit type. Exactly. Interesting. Exactly that. Uh, we made millionaire tycoon and you would go through and as you made more money in game, you would have to pay taxes. So, <laughs> so people would go through the TurboTax interface in uh in game and pay pay their taxes to like move on with the rest of the game and it was all themed as old turbo tax city and that game went top 15 got two wow. million plays and taxes were paid 50 million times wow that's fucking genius so and now and while you were all saying that i was kind of rethinking my original opinion i was like you know what if you're able to catch these kids early before they're even able to do taxes, before they're legally yeah. allowed, before they even have to pay because they're not making money yet. If you can get someone accustomed to your brand while they're young and adaptable and impressionable, oh my God, they're going to be a customer for life. And you know, I'm sure that TurboTax will see the benefit of that for decades. Honestly. Oh, for sure. And the craziest part is like, you know, you see a YouTube ad and you're skipping it or integration, you know, I'm skipping 10 seconds, 10 seconds. The average play time in the map was 40 minutes on wow. average. So that's people coming in and like staying in there for hours playing a branded experience. They knew it was a branded experience. So when your brand is associated with fun at that level, it's it's definitely an insane type of marketing that you can't get. I mean, I don't know where, where else you can no, get. No, I fully that. agree. I'm still so confused. I guess I, I just haven't played Fortnite in years, so I don't understand. But to me, I guess the old version of the game, I can't see any of this even like, I, I'm not able to understand it, you know? So I do need to go check it out and, no. and try it out again. But I guess like how... Yeah, I mean, I don't even want to ask deep on that because that would take so long to explain. But so, okay, then what? How? Uh, so you're still making money on that today. Yeah. And then how did the recent company come about? How, how much are you able to talk about that? Yeah, I need to talk about it the same way. Snapchat and uh, Fortnite came into the new business. We wanted to expand to something much bigger, and that's how we came together with all of our founders. Now have three other co-founders that fixated. And now we're kind of like a much larger. That's a great name, by the way. Thank you, thank like you. Yeah, no, I was I was hyped on it uh, when we when we found it. Try to I don't even know if we have that trademark. Hopefully we do. Oh shit, we should. Um, but we um we wanted to build like a much bigger creator company. So we had the the Snapchat offering that's evolved now into Snapchat Stories, which is similar uh, to to Snapchat Shows, where you distribute your stories every single day. Uh, we have the Fortnite business, the game studio, uh, and we. My other Jason and Zach, the other co-founders, come from management backgrounds, mm. so it only made sense to to work with a few clients in a management capacity. So we have a few talent under the roster, not scaled to anything wide, just focusing on like a few talent and doing really quality work with them. And then our more scalable services are Snapchat, Microsoft Start is starting up now as well. And then the newest one that I'm like most excited about is helping founders build personal brands on Mm. YouTube long form because we have this ginormous content team. There you go. And we traditionally, I mean, we've been working with a lot of entertainment based creators and, you know, went from a hundred K views to 160 million views, like six months with one creator. So Phil, we use these guys. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Cause we, I mean, Phil's obviously the genius behind the camera, but we need a whole editing team. We need all that. So yeah, so like 100,000 views to somebody who is selling a product or has some sort of outside offer is much more meaningful to, you know, a gaming channel with just an yeah. AdSense machine. So we can come in and make like a very significant impact for that cohort of, of founders. So that's that's the newest thing that we recently started. We have a few people working with Blake on that. I don't know if he wants nice. us to say that or not. So we'll Probably see. Matter. For Cal or what? Uh, for an Apex. Apex. Oh, gotcha. Nice. Yeah. Um, but... Yeah, so that, that's kind of the newest thing uh, across Fixated, but it's growing. We have 40 people. 40 people on the team? Yeah, 40 Holy people shit. on the team. What's Drawing your official Sean? title, by the way? What's your role? Chief business officer, whatever nice. that means. So what, is your, yeah, what, is your, what does your day-to-day look like? Like, wh- What are you mainly focused on right now? I'm like, my past skill set, like as you wrote, like anytime there's a new platform, I'm jumping on it. So any zero to one stage of a new platform opportunity or a new creator service, I'm figuring out how we can build the offer, turn it into something sca- scalable and deliver a good product. So nice. that's right now mainly between Snapchat, starting Microsoft Start, uh, and then the the YouTube offering. So 
that's just creating offers and, and signing talent up and making sure we're delivering a good product. You give me the vibe that you're you're totally cool with wearing any hat in the business. You ever heard that term? Yeah. No. Like I'll wear whatever hat I need to. And I'm curious how important you think that is uh, in any sort of like young entrepreneur. Yeah, you. I, I call it like being a garbage man. Like somebody's mm-hmm. got to do the random work. Even when you have 40 people, I, I'm doing very tedious little things. There's no way to escape that. Mm-hmm. So like some people think they're above it. No. And they're not even successful that's, yet. And I think that's the recipe for disaster. As soon as you're above it, that's when you die. Yeah. Like, because you have to constantly be learning every single day. There's like a new platform, a new opportunity where you can actually like take Microsoft Start, for example. Like, we'll see how this plays out or Fortnite. When the ecosystem changed and there was a new opportunity, there was a, like a chance that you could be the best person in the world mm-hmm. at making Fortnite maps. You can be the best person in the world at offering a service to creators on Microsoft Start. Mm -hmm. And anytime you can be the best at something in the world and get in front of a new parade where there's a lot of money being invested, I mean, these platforms spend billions of dollars to make their new initiatives work. Like TikTok Shop is another example of that. You got in front of a massive tidal wave. like, And man, guess what, dude? Like, We waited so long. Finally, my co-founder, I was like, he was like, TikTok shop, you got to check this out. I was like, no, dude, we're not going on TikTok shop. Yeah. And then right away, like craziest three months of sales ever. And I just wish we would have got on sooner. Um, You you have to. You have to jump But it happened in time. It happened as it should have. Yeah, you're probably part of that second wave. Yeah, hope so. I mean, our whole goal is to become like the primary high quality active wear on TikTok shop. Yeah. Because right now it's just known for Temu and drop shipping and cheap and shrink and you know, it's always like I could buy some from somebody else for cheap. That's the current motto on TikTok right now. This brand sells for cheap. Yeah, if you want cheaper, go buy from someone fucking else. Like it's that simple. Yeah. And I think that's going to take some time to get away from. But I don't. Yeah, I think you're right. I think the second wave is coming pretty soon here. Yeah. No, I've been seeing the flash sales, like all the TikTok shop. Like, yeah. They stuff. just can't do that forever. Timu is doing it strong. I mean. I, handing out sales and stuff well i mean yeah that's the whole platform like they've gamified e-commerce like cheap e-commerce like they do ridiculous i mean did you watch the super bowl do you see how many commercials they had they no, own i didn't watch the super bowl they i was too fucking own. busy but i heard the founder of uh team or Temu, whatever is the wealthiest person in asia right now yeah no they do numbers so i don't think the the cheap stuff is ever going out of style well i just mean they're they're subsidizing eventually has to oh stop. yeah 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 because they were All just the giving out crazy losses discount. i mean that's why we were ripping at the beginning is like right. our shorts were always known as like 50 60 dollars or whatever that's our hero product and then all of a sudden it was like oh i can buy them for 30 or 20 whatever yeah, yeah, so yeah. and so they were just tiktok was paying us for other people to buy exactly. which is crazy that's the example of like you got the a, a new platform initiative just get in front of it and they'll pay you for it and they'll sneeze out Mm. A few million dollars at you like it's nothing because it's such a massive ecosystem. Okay, so I have a really important question for you. And this is kind of like a bounce off of the the wear every hat one, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm sure you're also good at finding great talent, right? Seems like it. What's your biggest piece of advice on that? Is it a gut feeling? How do you know if someone, like, I need this guy on my team? I ask all the smartest people around me that I secretly want to hire for the job, but I feel like I probably couldn't because, you know, sometimes it's hard to get those people in. Mm. Like who is around, like who are their favorite people that can do this? Like, Mm. like just ask all the smart people in your network who's good for this. And they usually like, you'll, you'll find a lot of gems that way. That's like the fastest way to find find good. That's interesting. You say that because I, once again, from the $100 million water guy, um, another piece, or no, this was a different founder I had on the podcast. He gave me the advice. He said, whenever you're asking someone for money, never ask them for money. I always say, do you know anyone who might be interested? You tell them, you're so, you tell them, yeah, you know, we're doing this. We're growing crazy fast. Like, we don't really need money, but like the business is probably going to fucking launch this next month. You know, do you know anyone who might be interested? He's like, exactly. that, that is the method. Exactly. So and make sure it sounds like super appealing, like definitely frame up the, the job and make it something cool. But I, the, the other piece of that is like, I'm sure, I mean, you probably experienced it, but like hiring the wrong person is extremely easy to do. New, new method unlock for Squid. Uh, I have them do assignments, like just not like a super big assignment, but just something to show that they can do like they have the competence to do like the basic tasks that I need them to do. Mm. And then you immediately see a ton of people drop off or you see somebody that you thought was the best candidate and then you see their assignment and it 
it shows the holes and kind of like what they know. And then you'll have other people that surprise you mm. and like do it really well. So that, that's been like a really, really helpful way to save a ton of time. Because once you hire the wrong person, then you give them enough time to try and see if they can like get it together. And then you hire other people off their network and those people aren't great. And it's that's just like true. long rabbit hole of like the wrong people. So yeah. I'm having to deal with that right now. I'm going through a whole system right now where I'm just hiring like dozens and dozens of uh, UGC guys. Yeah. And that's kind of what I'm trying to do. I'm saying like, oh, make me two videos, pay 500 bucks, whatever. And then if those ones do really well, then I'll put you on a retainer. Same kind of thing, yeah. but for content. Oh, for sure. Well, dude, that kind of answered all my questions. Oh, here's a good one for you. How much money uh, did you have in your bank before you realized like money didn't matter that much to you? Or money? Uh, let me ask that again, actually. Does money matter? It does money buy happiness? I mean, I wouldn't say I have enough to answer that question because I'm still on this treadmill that I'm sure will never end. But I think like I'm not like a super flashy person. So to me, my lifestyle, like I feel like I live extremely lavishly and it's probably not that much money to do how, how I live. So uh, I guess the answer, like, is are you saying does money buy happiness? Does money buy happiness is question number one. Uh, that I mean, everybody has the same cliche answer. No, it doesn't, but yeah. it gives you opportunities. I think waking up whenever I want to is like something that I get great joy out of. So in moments, yes, but it, it doesn't save you from from this world. And of course, there's hard things that happen. So. So I guess no is the right answer. Yeah. But yes, it definitely makes things a lot easier, a lot more fun. Um, and I think people that get like too stoic on that are like wrong. Okay. Like money definitely changes changes things. Fair enough. Fair enough. And then uh, so what's the long-term plan um, for you personally right now? Like, it, it, And it can be – it doesn't even have to necessarily like be about fixated or your mm -hmm. business like – in your life, what's your long-term plan right now? I want to build this business. I want to sell it. I want to start a family. What are you, are you even looking that far? I'm one of those weirdos who like uh, thinks about my future kids like 20 years from now as like a, as, like, a deeper purpose for what I'm doing. Oh, yeah. Um, which is like definitely weird, a little psychotic. I don't think so. Good. Yeah, well, that, I definitely think about future family stuff, pretty family-oriented. So like past just taking care of my family and future family, which again, cliche stuff, but genuinely that's kind of how... I'm thinking, I guess I just want to help creators make a bunch of money. Like, mm. to put it simply, building a brand and company around doing that, going into the future, there's going to be about a million ways to make money. And the I, creator economy is only going to fucking scale. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's so small compared to what it will be even in a few years. So I just want to continue to position myself, like we said earlier, to put on creators and help them make a ton of money. And in return, you know, the ecosystem's so big, we'll build a big business. Yeah, dude. I mean, it's it's crazy because, and this is, I'd love to hear your take on this. Like, I truly believe if someone has a lot of money, like, I don't know if you saw my video on this, but I said, there's a lot of people that have money that don't deserve it. But if you don't have money, you don't deserve it. Mm -hmm. And it's that simple. Like, yeah. you provide value, you make money. If you help a lot of other people make money, you will make a lot of money. No, if 100%. you create a great product or a great service, you will make money. It's that simple. It, it really is. is that fucking simple. It like, is. obviously, there's details and, and work involved. It's a matter of time, honestly. And the thing you posted today about the one-year recap that I wanted to talk to you about. Two-year like, recap? Two-year recap. Yeah, yeah. Is like you feel like you're working so hard, but maybe the, the, the progress or like the sales aren't converting. I was punching at a cinder block wall <laughs> for years before anything like really significantly worked in a way where I made like any money. So, but... All of the connections and skill sets from the past compounded perfectly for mm. me to be at the right place at the right time. So if you're punching and nothing's happening, it's because you're like perfectly aligning with the timing of the opportunity and building skill sets to be able to execute when the moment comes. So like for me, when I saw that, I was yeah. like, oh, he just has a lagging indicator of mm. all the work that he's done in the past and it's going to compound and show. But I appreciate you saying that. Um, and I know it will. And I think... You know, what's interesting, like in my case, is my net worth is not necessarily like where I'd want it to be right now. Mm -hmm. But I do feel like my, uh, I'm, what's the right way to word this? I have friends that are like my age that are worth like over $100 million. 
but they all fucking like come to me for advice and ask me for connections yeah. and ask me for life advice and they want to hang out and pay for me to come on trips with them and so like i feel like i'm extremely wealthy in that sense um and extremely like blessed and fortunate too because i feel like the money will come eventually for sure um whether it, you know maybe our when we finally launch to youtube it's going to go fucking crazy or maybe when this new line of products comes out for the business the business is going to go yeah. fucking crazy or once we finish raising it's gonna, who knows um but even though like the money is not where i want it to be yet even though i don't spend that much money i feel like my life is fucking awesome right now dude like i have nothing to complain about the money will come with time, but like, bro, being able to travel the world and get to meet dope guys like yourself, being in San Diego, LA now, going up to Santa Barbara right next, going to Miami, New York, doing this, po- like, I don't think anybody else is doing like a young money podcast like this. Like, I don't know. I definitely feel like I'm about to get this tattooed on my arm. I always tell myself, like, I am actually the luckiest guy in the world because it also helps you look at life a different way as well. But I appreciate you saying that. Yeah. Um, and that makes me feel... Uh, that makes me feel good. There was um, another founder friend of mine has this uh, poster on his wall that said, this is the moment. And it's a flat graph. And then it takes off like vertically like this. Yeah. And there's a red dot like right there at the beginning. And it's just a good reminder. Like you never know when it'll happen. Um, you just have to survive through the valley of despair to get there. Yeah. And you're not, I mean, you're, you're past that, but it does, yeah. there's peaks and valleys and you just have to stick with it, but. For sure. And, yeah. and you know, that's not to like. I mean, it's not like you're, you're crushing. Like, and I mean, somebody I, behind the camera is like pissed off, like Squid's talking about how his sales are not, uh, he's not worth a hundred million dollars. No, right for now. sure. And I don't want anyone to listen to this to be like, bro, shut up. But the truth is like, and I think as an entrepreneur, you never are really satisfied. Like when I was first starting the business, when we, when I was thinking like, damn, hitting 10K would be fucking awesome. When we hit that, I didn't yeah. feel happy at all. Like when I hit 100K, I didn't feel happy at all. When we hit a million, didn't feel happy at all. And I don't think I'll ever really um, like be okay with like settling or whatever, or, like chilling out. Like I want to work till the day I die and keep on going bigger and bigger. Um, but I've gotten better at uh, being happy on that climb for yeah. sure. Why so do you want fun. money? Um, I don't, dude, I don't really care about money that much. I know the money will come, but I'm just very, I said this on the pod with Santa Cruz Medicinals too. He asked me the exact same question. He's like, why do you need to be so rich? And I said, I'm just fucking curious, dude. Yeah. I'm curious. Like, why not? I'm curious. Exactly. The why not question. D- saw Daniel Dallin's video the other day. That's fire. Yeah. I'm curious, bro. Like, um, one of my best friends in college, his dad was like, is the CEO of like a hundred million, uh, uh, not a hundred million dollar company. Fortune 100 company. Oh, wow. They have seven jets, and he would take us and uh, and his kid and all of us on on the company jet all the time. And I couldn't even enjoy it because I was like, all my friends were like taking pictures, like drinking the champagne. And I couldn't enjoy it because I was like, I need to know what this feels like. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I need to know what this. I need yeah. to like you talk about like envisioning your kids in the future. I don't think that's weird at all because I do the same thing, and I have this little vision in my mind of like. I'm on the front of the yacht. I'm holding my newborn kid. Beautiful yeah. wife comes up from behind, gives me a hug. How could you not be able to experience that and be okay with your life? That yeah. sounds so fucking, no. uh, uh, what do you, what's the word? That sounds so horrible to say, but that's how I feel. Like, no. I need to know what that's like. Dude, I have a similar thing where I want the feeling of like, which will never happen of like dunking on somebody in like the NBA finals, like John Morant or yeah. like doing something or like being like Drake on stage with this massive crowd. Like those feelings, it pisses me off that I will never, like I'm not going to be dunking on anybody anytime soon. So my version of this yeah. is I'm like finding some way to get that in business, which is kind of like what I like that. Me. That's a good way to look at it for it's sure. It's frustrating though. I would love to dunk on somebody. With that being said, what would your advice, you know, it's a pretty general question, but what would your advice, um, to yourself, I forget exactly what the range was, but what would your advice be today to move faster if you could go back, if you had 60 seconds to talk yeah. to that version of you working at Vons? I would, I mean, and this goes for everybody's so well. I think there's like this weird culture of like Iman Ghazi, people that think they need to start their own business. I would go immediately and try and find a startup or a small company that I could work for for free. Sometimes working for free is too expensive too because like people don't want to deal with you. They try to get rid of me at 3K a month. Yeah. So like go somewhere where you can have like a high commission job that pays you for performance and just download exact 
exactly what the business model is, network with the people at the top, practice those skill sets mm-hmm. of what actually makes money, stay close to the money. Like don't just be like a, you know, a tedious like coordinator, like go and like close money. And, and in doing that, that it'll like speed up your process. So mm-hmm. the weird, the weirdest way I would say to like get money faster is to go get a job where you can actually have like an impact and learn and meet people and then go do it on your own. Yeah, dude. And that's what so many people get wrong is they want money now, now, now. But you know, if you don't focus on money and instead you focus on really building your value, building your network, building your experience, then, you know, that's literally what we just were talking about. Then it's only a matter of time before it rips. Yeah. It's like, dude, you're in a jungle alone and then put a blindfold on your own trying to start a business with no skill sets, connections or money. Like, dude, you're not going to beat the next guy who has all those things like go join the winning team yeah see what they're doing and almost every massive successful um silicon valley startup founder joined on somebody else's train and hopped off at the chosen destination and then starts their own thing so it's right did you you didn't get a job that you just i had a lot of jobs like in you worked at the restaurant i worked in multiple restaurants and then i worked um i had like i was always fucking working dude that's like bro people uh are in my car it doesn't bug me all the time but like People are in my comments like, bro, got a hand out. I was like, bro, I've been working since day one. Um, but I, uh, I worked for like a couple different startups, like an alcohol startup. Okay, so and then I worked for like a marketing agency startup. And then I worked for a commercial real estate company so and yeah. then started the business. Yeah. I get it. All right. Last question, bro. I like to ask this to everybody. Feel free to take like as much time as you need to think about it. Sure. What's uh what's one truth you hold to be true that you think almost everybody else would certainly disagree with? And it could be on business or life or anything. It's like what's your controversial mm-hmm. take? Yeah, so it's like, yeah, what's something I believe that most people don't? Basically? Yeah, what's like your guiding principle that if you told like ninety nine percent of fucking humans, they'd be like, What? Dude, that's hard. I gotta think of like my biggest contrarian beliefs. I'm about to be sitting here like Elon Musk, do a long pause. Yeah. Let it linger. I'll do a zoom in on your face. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I'm going to say some dumb shit at the end. Dude, I don't know if I have like specific contrarian beliefs. Like, hmm. I mean, I've been, I I was was talking to Blake about this one and I can't say what he he was saying. Not that it was bad, but like, I don't want to like put words in his mouth. But he had a very great answer for this. You probably asked him this question. Damn, this is hard. Dude, we're going to need to cut, and I'm going to need to think. Hold on. Let me cook on this. We'll cut. Let me cook on this. Let me cook on this real quick. <laughs> Dude, not going to be too big of a build up. To be honest with you, I don't know if I have some like thing that 99% of people disagree with. I guess I'm okay. Here, here's one that other people close to me think is a little crazy. I, I'm okay with sacrificing my short-term health for an obsession in business that is a little bit unhealthy socially, physically, Mm -hmm. not working out, not a good diet, not doing things socially like I should. Like since when I dropped out of college, I just sat in my room all day with a ridiculous, unhealthy obsession to make it work. And that level of being unbalanced allows me now to be as balanced as I want because I'm sitting on more flexibility and resources to work on those other parts of my life. So to truly be balanced, I think you need to go through extreme periods of not being balanced. Dude, and I'll sacrifice that. anything for that. That's 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 perfectly said. And, and you can even like expand that out on a lifespan. Like if you focus up in your early twenties for a couple if you if you cut out everyone like, you know, you don't have to do this, but I have a lot of friends, like my one friend who's worth over a hundred and he's twenty two, he cut off the world. For two years. That's it, two years. And he didn't talk to anyone. And he didn't have a girlfriend. He didn't do anything but grind. Mm. Um, and he didn't make the $100 million in those two years. But that laid the foundation. And he's still grinding today. Mm. But that's what laid the foundation for him to build what he has now. That's and it's always the same thing. Every single person I meet, no one, is, no one is ever like, oh, I was building something on the side. And then it just happened. Like Almost every single founder or just creative genius that's made a ton of money, had a ton of success, or even creators like a, a kid like dylan latham they fucking locked in you got to lock in for a, a short period of time become extremely unbalanced so that you can live the rest of your life balanced. yeah dude and don't do it alone like i had people put me on like jason not i have to give him his flowers he took me out of a grocery store i was a kid at a party who like 
randomly came up to him and and then I got fired. They wanted to fire me and he still kept me around because he like saw how hungry I was for it. So like if you can find somebody who believes in you more than you believe in yourself early on, yeah, it's like awesome. that'll pull you through those like rough times where you're punching the cinder block wall and nothing's happening. So like I would not be here if it wasn't for that. Hell yeah. That's a perfect way to end. Yeah. Sweet. Thank yeah. you guys for watching. Um, I'm gonna link all this stuff. I know you're kind of behind the scenes, but I'm gonna link all of this stuff. You guys wanna go check them out. Yeah, You'll own. probably get fucking flooded with DMs after this, but you can pick and choose which one you want to answer. Take all of them. Uh, but thank you guys for watching. Make sure to leave a like, comment, and, uh, and subscribe.